I think you guys remember John Yasa. He's the comedian who gave the talk just before lunch. Um, I, I think his next talk will be equally as funny. That's gauntlet thrown. Um, the next two. The next two tutorials, not demos, are meant to actually teach you something, unlike, unlike Eric's, which was meant to just throw a huge amount of information at you and hope something sticks. Um, that's not a knock on Eric. That's what I asked him to do. <laughs> um, if you've seen The Matrix, there's that moment when they like strap him in the chair and he doesn't know Kung Fu, and then they like port something into his head, and he sits up and he goes, I know Kung Fu. That's, that's what these next two talks are meant to be for you. So by all means, you're, there's a GitHub repo. Uh, Try and clone it. Try and follow along. The, it's just not enough time to give you like a detailed tutorial. Ask questions. But the point is we're giving you these repos. They're both structured in a way that will hopefully let you go back and look at them after the fact and get more out of them by reviewing them after you've been told how to use them by John and then Rob. That's great. Justin took a lot of my intro. So I will say that I'm slated for an hour. I don't think it's going to take an hour. Um, I hope that it takes some amount of time and then you can have a, a discussion as well. Maybe you've had some troubles getting derivatives for your models. Maybe you want to talk about, I'm thinking about doing this, but how would I do that? Uh, we got some short uh, discussions about that as well after this. So my name's still John. I worked on this presentation with Justin explicitly, but it's based on, as Justin already mentioned, a presentation that Ben gave uh, to Boeing. And so some of these slides come from that. Some of them come from another workshop that I mentioned where I had a six to eight hour uh, open MDO training session. And then some of them are fresh uh, for today. So if there are any issues, you are the guinea pigs. This session assumes some knowledge. You're all here for the workshop. You didn't just sign up because it sounded fun. Uh, we're assuming that you've used open MDO models before or you're mildly aware of the API and what that means. We're hoping that you understand when gradient-based optimizations, uh, gradient-based optimization methods are advantageous, but if you don't, I'll have a little bit of motivation about why they are. And then lastly, we need a working understanding of what it means to differentiate by hand, what derivatives actually mean, of course. This goes all the way back to Calc 1, uh, but the idea is that we need to understand why derivatives are used and, and how to get them as well. As Justin mentioned, all of the slides that I'm showing today, as well as the tutorial scripts, are available on this GitHub repo. It's github.com slash openmdo, so the openmdo organization, openmdo underscore training. Um, please go there if you want. You can follow along. If you're not going to follow along, it's A-OK. -okay. I have all the code that we need to talk about in these slides, and we can discuss that as we go through it as well. Uh, that repo actually contains a lot of information. It contains that full eight-hour workshop that we discussed, but what we're just going to talk about today is contained within the Getting Derivatives and OpenMDO folder. And so there are just a few examples inside of that subfolder. Why do we need to do gradient-based optimization with analytic derivatives? The idea is that it allows us to explore the design space and, and find a better answer for a lot of, a lot of models. You might have seen a plot like this before or one like it. We have time on the y-axis and the number of design variables on the x-axis. And so as our optimization problem increases in size and complexity, how long does it take to actually solve that problem? If we look at the gradient-free optimizers up there, it takes quite a while compared to the finite difference method using gradient-based optimizers. So that's already a big improvement, just switching to gradient-based algorithms and using finite difference. But we can see some great speed ups if we move to using analytic derivatives there. We have forward analytic methods. And then as Professor Martins discussed in detail yesterday, and as we've heard discussed before, uh, we have an adjoint analytic methods, which will really allow us to, to get some huge computational savings uh, when we have the right kind of models. And we see a lot of these, these right kind of models in aerospace applications and space vehicles, wind energy, et cetera. Anywhere where the number of design variables you have is large compared to the number of functions of interest, hopefully your numbers of functions of interest is small, uh, that's where the adjoint method really shines. Uh, there are some little nuggets uh, of detail over there and, and some papers to find as well. Uh, again, if you have the slides on your computer, all of these papers mentioned throughout the presentation are hyperlinked and you should be able to, to check them out for more details. Your goals for today. Uh, hopefully we're going to understand how to get partial derivatives for your components and what that means. We're going to examine briefly the difference between explicit and implicit components, especially what that means for getting derivatives. And then lastly, we're going to look at some advanced techniques. And so if you're a, a mildly seasoned OpenMDO user, I hope that at least this third bullet will have some interesting nuggets that you can take and apply to your own work. There are some that uh, even I didn't know about fully until I went to the docs and read about what is possible with some of them. So again, if you're, if you're kind of new to it, or maybe you have some models that don't have derivatives, bullets one and two are going to be important. 
And then lastly, three, if you're, if you're more experienced with OpenMDAO. And uh, I didn't say this again, just interrupt at any time uh, if you have any questions or comments about anything that's going on. So this is gonna open up that, that first bullet point. Why do we need derivatives? Well, I kind of motivated that, right? We want gradient-based optimization to work. We want to do it efficiently. I'll go into more detail about how we do that with an open MDAO and how those are processed. And then the, the main point of this talk is to say, how can we efficiently get those derivatives to enable that gradient-based optimization? So open MDAO can do a lot of things, as, as you might have guessed. It can do DOEs, so just design of experiments where we're not putting an optimizer on it. We're just sampling the design space or it can do uh, gradient-free optimization or gradient-based optimization. If we want to do gradient-based optimization, let's say that you agree with us that, that it makes sense to use derivative information to explore the design space, we need the total derivatives of the model. On the right-hand side here, we have a, a rather simplistic model. We have some inputs, X. We have components or groups that evaluate or do some computations, A, B, and C, and it, it outputs this function, F. And we need to figure out the derivatives of f with respect to x as shown there. And these are, these are total derivatives. And we'll get to why that matters in a moment. We've been talking about it, but let's just go through a brief explanation. I'll kind of zoom through some of these slides with the idea that you already know a lot of the theory. If you don't, feel free to go back and revisit them as needed. Finite difference. You can perturb your model and get an approximation for the derivatives. It's inaccurate in some ways, and it's also expensive, especially as you increase the size of your optimization problem. It's easy, though, because you can treat your model as a black box. You don't need any information about it. You don't need to, to have the source code for your model. You simply perturb the inputs going into the model, get different outputs, and then look at how those outputs change to obtain some derivative information about your model. Justin will always be adamant, and I, I think other people will be too, that you should not finite difference uh, across solvers. We saw some of those results that Eric showed from, uh, from PyCycle comparing to NPSS, what that means when you finite difference across a solver and how much information you lose when you do that. Uh, there are lots of papers on this topic here where you can go in for more information and see some comparisons, but in general, it's, it's not a good idea to finite difference across solvers. Professor Myron's mentioned this as well, and there's his paper in the, in the bottom right-hand corner, but complex step is a better method uh, than just straight finite difference. There are some issues with complex step. The biggest is you may need some information about your model or you may need to code it so that it can handle complex numbers. Other than that, it works the same as finite difference. You simply perturb it this time in the complex plane and you get much more accurate information about your gradients uh, because it does not suffer from the same errors that finite difference does. You're able to use a very small step size because it's perturbed in the complex plane. You get all of that information from that very small step size. And so complex step is what we use in the MDO lab to compare our analytic derivatives to make sure that they're correct. Because when you use that very small step size, uh, the error is extremely low. We see it's on the order h squared. If you're using an h of 1e negative 40, uh, that's a fantastic way to check your derivatives. So this is exciting. Analytic derivatives are fast and accurate. But how do we actually get these? We can look at this, this simple model that we looked at before. We want to get the total derivatives. We need to propagate the chain rule throughout these partial derivatives for each one of these components to get those total derivatives. For example, if we look at A, we need partial Y, partial X, partial YB, partial YA, et cetera, and put those together using the chain rule. Maybe this makes sense if you remember calc one through three. I'm, I'm not sure where that was covered. It made limited sense to me at the time. Uh, it makes more sense now. But what doesn't make sense immediately, unless you think about it, is how do you solve for models with coupling, especially generic or advanced or nested coupling? We need to somehow converge this coupling right here. We can use a nonlinear solver, this block outside L method or the Newton solver to converge that coupling. And the way that the solver loop happens may change the way you compute analytic derivatives. We can still write an analytic expression for this, even with the coupling. We have the total F with the total X still, we expand that out and this is what it looks like now. But notice that it's not only partials. We have some other semi-total derivatives that we need to be concerned about. And so when we introduce coupling into the model, if we try to write out an analytic expression, it may become more complex. You may need more paper to actually write out these terms. This is a detail, but these terms will be computed using adjoints. OpenMDO can do that behind the scenes for you. So you don't need to understand the adjoint implementation to reap the benefits of that. I mentioned this, but doesn't this get scary? If you have a big model with different solver convergence loops, uh, maybe they're nested solvers, how are you going to write an expression for DFDX, the total derivatives that you need? Um, it's not going to happen. Luckily, we can ask OpenMDO, as you might know already. For a deep dive on the math, uh, check out a few of the papers that have been discussed already coming out of the MDO lab. Uh, they're marked there with hyperlinks as well.
And so under the hood, OpenMDO splits total derivative computation into two different steps. The first is to compute the partial derivatives for each component. And this step number one is what we're focusing on today, is how to get those partial derivatives for the components. We are responsible for this step. OpenMDO can help us. We can kind of offload some of that responsibility if we don't want to do that. There are lots of different options for getting these partial derivatives. I'll go into much more detail about that. Immediately after getting these partial derivatives, we can combine them by solving a linear system to obtain these total derivatives. That's what OpenMDO does behind the hood. You can choose the, the linear solver that actually solves that linear system, but all of that happens without, without you needing to actually implement a linear solver. And that's one of the main benefits of OpenMDO. And so with analytic derivative functionality in OpenMDO, we can solve huge design problems. We can get derivatives across that model that would have been very challenging to write out analytically. We only need to provide partial derivatives of our components. And then lastly, and this is a very uh, important bit, you can mix and match different derivative techniques. You can have a heterogeneous model getting derivatives in different ways. Even within the same component, you can have a, an approximation through finite difference or complex step and analytic derivatives within that same component. So that's a really powerful tool to help you get these models into a gradient-based optimization problem. And so we've been talking about this uh, the past two days a lot. The docs are fantastic. I find the search bar to be a lifesaver. Uh, you can go there and uh, search for what you're looking for and hopefully it pops up and maybe the first five results. Uh, it's been drastically improved from the previous search bar days of V1. That being said, on the right-hand side here, I have a, an outline of a very helpful doc set. It's called Working with Derivatives. And so it's a core feature and it's got a lot of information that we'll go through today, but with much more information. We're going to zoom in on that top portion of it right now. It says using finite difference or complex step, providing analytic partials, and then verifying partial derivatives. And so I'll kind of walk you through in this tutorial how to do some of these things. Before I move on to this next bullet point, we're looking at the partials for explicit component. What questions do you have? Are you excited to do gradient-based optimization? <laughs> okay, good. I'll walk you through a few methods about how to get partial derivatives here for this explicit component. And then we'll talk about what that means as well. Lastly, here it's, uh, it's mentioned, in the explicit examples folder in the repo, we have all the code that I'll be showing you. You can play around with it, change some of the, the settings if you want, uh, and follow along. So explicit components are any component that's computing something. You have an explicit, and this is why it's called explicit component, you have an explicit expression for what you're trying to compute. You have inputs that are mapped to outputs. It may be as simple as y equals mx plus b. x could be an input, m and b are maybe options or different inputs, but that y is an explicitly uh, computed part that comes out of this explicit component. It could be as complex as an adjoint CFD solver. If you want, you could take AD flow or SU2 or some other solver and wrap that into an explicit component and then give that to OpenMDO. It doesn't need to know about all the internal workings. It simply knows the inputs mapped to these outputs through this explicit relationship. We will not detail an adjoint-based CFD solver. We will detail this very simple expression here for computing the lift based on CL and then your flight condition as well. So if you're from aerospace or, or wind energy or some other field where you've seen this before, maybe this makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, it doesn't need to make sense. We'll simply look at this as a, a simple expression that has some terms that are being multiplied together and we'll see what we need to give to OpenMDO uh, to handle that. So you might look at this, we see L lift equals, and then we have a few other terms here. We have CL, the coefficient of lift. We have rho, the, the air density, V, which stands for velocity. And then we have S ref, which is the, the wing area, the reference wing area. The half is a number, the squared is an operator. And then we have four inputs coming into this to get one output, the lift right there. If we want to compute the derivatives, again, we're focusing on the partial derivative computation. We could write an expression for this. Go back to those calc one days, Think about what it means to use the power rule, et cetera. And we can write out expressions for each one of these partials. So we have partial L, partial V. We move that to, you know how to do this. And if you don't know how, Wolfram Alpha can help. <laughs> and so this is one way to get the partial derivatives for your, your model. You can hand derive them and then input that into OpenMDAO. And then you know that these are correct. If you've done them correct, they're analytic so that they're exact. And they're also generally quick because you have a, a very simple expression to obtain these partial derivatives. And then I want to mention this right now uh, before we go into any examples. I just want to tell you that OpenMDO can approximate derivatives for you. It can use that finite difference or complex step part for the partial derivatives. So within a component, if you don't want to do that math, you can ask OpenMDO to approximate the derivatives for you. Unfortunately, it's usually more expensive than analytic derivatives, but, and this is a big benefit, 
it does not require additional engineer or programmer time uh, to just say, please approximate these derivatives. Uh, you don't have to derive those expressions that I showed previously. That being said, let's show what this means in code. And so here we have an entire explicit component. It's called compute lift. We're computing that lift that I showed before. There's the actual expression for it from theory. And we have uh, the three basic uh, methods that we need for an explicit component. We initialize with an OpenMDO. We set up and then we compute as well. And again, I'm assuming that you have some knowledge about how OpenMDO is structured. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about what all of this means. I will highlight a few things. I'll highlight these four inputs that I mentioned before here. We have CL rho velocity and S ref. We have explanations of them and the units that they're in as well. We have that one output that's lift and that's all happening in the setup function. Then we have the compute function here where we take that and we translate it to the output for lift. You might say, John, I see in the lower right hand corner a one line expression for this computation and then you're showing me a 22 line component. What do I gain from actually using OpenMDO? This is a question I get a lot from students, uh, from potential collaborators, from other people. And to that I say, right now, you're not getting any benefit from this because you can write this expression. It's very easy to solve this equation. It's relatively easy to get the partial derivatives as well. But where OpenMDO shines is for larger models where you're connecting many components that look like this, components that maybe have a, a more advanced compute function as well. And then like I mentioned, if you have a CFD solver, it would be so challenging to try to write this out yourself and get the framework to talk to each other uh, correctly. And so I think that's really where OpenMDO shines. For right now, it may seem a little bit silly. You say I can use Excel. We're gonna use this as a simple function to talk about today though. Here's what we're gonna, we're gonna show, you, show you how to approximate the partial derivatives. So here is where we actually tell OpenMDO that all outputs depend on all inputs. And I'll, I'll show you what that means in just a moment. I'm gonna go back one slide and show that full explicit component. In the setup function, we only say inputs and outputs. We do not declare any partial information. We don't tell OpenMDO anything about the derivative information. So if you didn't need derivatives, if this hour is worthless for you, this is all that you need. You have the inputs, you have the outputs that are being computed from those inputs, and we don't actually need any derivative information. But let's hope that you need derivatives, and this will be relevant. You can declare the partials. And this right here is the simplest partials declaration that could happen. It uses asterisks or wildcards to say that all outputs depend on all inputs. This is a very non-verbose way of saying that. You could say of equals the asterisk, so derivatives of everything with respect to everything. Uh, and there are many different options within the declare partials uh, function as well. And so you can check that out in the API to see everything that's there. For right now, we're simply asking OpenMDO, uh, please be aware that all outputs uh, depend on all inputs. Lift depends on all four of these inputs. If we think about the actual Jacobian, if we think about the theory of what this Jacobian is, it would look like this. We have this, this matrix, and then we have these four partials uh, that we discussed. However, if we go back one slide again and we look at what's going on here, these inputs and outputs are all vectors. They have shape of NN, which stands for number of nodes. And so the idea here is if you have a multi-point condition, if you're analyzing the performance of your aircraft in multiple flight conditions or maybe across a mission, you can analyze uh, multiple points at the same time by using vectorization. And so this is a dead simple example of vectorization where we have a number of nodes for the output, number of nodes for the inputs. It's a one-to-one -one mapping in this case. We're going to have a derivatives only on the diagonal. I'll show you what that means in a moment, but know that this Jacobian is actually a matrix of submatrices. Each input is really a vector, as I just highlighted. Each output is a vector as well, and each one of these uh, entries is totally separate from all others due to the computations that we're doing here. That's not generally true, but because of this simple example, that is true today. If we actually looked at these partial derivatives, each one of them is a square matrix with entries only on the diagonal. This is what that looks like pictorially. We see that each one of these partials, partial L, partial V, for example, is a three by three matrix with entries only on the diagonal. We'll get to why this matters, uh, but for right now, we just need to know, okay, we need to provide information for all of the partials that exist on this diagonal. We need to make sure that OpenMDO knows what these partials are. And this is how we do that. And so I, I'm showing just a, a bit of this explicit component. I'm not showing all of it, but we have that compute up there from before. And now I'm introducing this compute partials method here. And so it takes in the inputs and it receives this partials dictionary and we're going to fill that partials dictionary with the actual partial derivative information uh, across those diagonals that I showed. And so I say here in white, give OpenMDO the expressions that we computed before we had those analytic expressions. We need to make sure that they match the shape of the Jacobian. And so we have this numpy.i function that makes an identity matrix. In this case, it creates those diagonals uh, to fill in for the partial derivative information. 
This is a relatively simple analytic expression again for all the derivatives. We'll move on for now and explain how else we can get derivatives. But how do we know that our derivatives are correct? We need some way of checking them. I mentioned using the complex step method or maybe finite differences to do that. OpenMDO, as you may know, comes bundled with this check partials method that allows us to perturb the model, examine the, the approximated partial and total derivatives, and then compare those with our model. And so this is just a quick screenshot of what that looks like. Uh, there's a lot going on here, but we can draw our attention to, on the right-hand side, we see greater than signs, abs tall, greater than rel tall. So this is where the derivatives are wrong, greater than some tolerance. I purposely made them wrong here for this model that I'm showing. It's to show that, oh, there's a problem here. We need to investigate that. We see at the bottom here, there's a printout. Subject with the largest relative error is this, and that tells you where to check for errors in your model. And so that's one option to kind of check your partial derivatives intelligently using built-in OpenMDO features. So let's say we have the derivatives correct. Maybe you have some information about the sparsity pattern of those derivatives like I showed you, and we want to take advantage of that. I will first motivate this with a, with a very personal case. Without using any tips and tricks, just using dense Jacobians, a certain open error struct model took 460 seconds to run, and that's computing the partial derivative information, uh, computing the total derivatives, and then doing an optimization. However, if we use some of the tools that OpenMDO comes bundled with, these sparse Jacobians, and then doing that intelligently, we can save a lot of time. In this case, we got an 80x speed up by simply telling OpenMDO the same information in a different way, in a slightly more intelligent way, and taking advantage of some of that sparsity information. I'll get into how to do that for, again, this very simple explicit component. And so remember, we had these three by three matrices. It's very straightforward. They're only diagonal. Why do we need to care about the off diagonals? We don't. We can compress those into vectors in this case. And that's where we take advantage of that sparsity pattern. Again, I want to say that this example is extremely simple. In reality, your sparsity patterns may look much more wild. They may look like space invaders or some other kind of pixel art that doesn't make any sense to you. And OpenMDO helps you make sense of that, again, through that check partials command and then through a few visualization uh, tools that I'll show later on. For now, these are very simple three by one vectors. Uh, that we simply need to give that same information to slightly differently for OpenMDO to get the partial derivatives. And so this is how we tell OpenMDO what the shape of the Jacobian is. When we do our declare partials, again, we're saying everything depends on everything. We have those two wild cards, but we say we have the rows and the columns of the matrix of the actual Jacobian that we want to instantiate so that we can fill in with information. So we say sparse, par sparse partials here. We give the range of them. It goes 0, 1, 2. The rows correspond to 0, 1, 2, as well as the columns. That creates this diagonal matrix that compresses it down to a 3 by 1 vector for the sparse partials. Because we did that, our compute partials look slightly different. It's now expecting vectors instead of that, that array that we showed before. And because the shapes are different, we no longer need that numpy.i. We don't need to construct an identity matrix because it's already expecting vectors, which this information is already in vector form. And we just give that to OpenMDO. It saves memory and it saves uh, computational time as well. Graham. Back to slide. Yes. That A range, is that numpy.a range? It is numpy in this case, yeah. So these are integers uh, telling you the indices of the Jacobian matrix. Yeah. yeah that, arguably, we shouldn't have named the variable A range, but uh, yeah, so that, that's just. Let's call that foo, right? Foo equals numpy a range, and then rows equals foo, calls equals foo. Any further Does questions? Work when your, all your have the same no. Oh, man. No. So this example, again, <laughs> dead simple. It works for any sort of shaped inputs and shaped outputs. I can give personal examples from open error struct. The mesh sizes can be wildly different coming Let, in. I, so he's asking about the star oh. star. So there's a precedence. Um, the last one you declare will override. So like, let's say five of your partial sub-Jacobians were square and, and did this. But you can also declare particular pairs or particular sub-pairs. You don't have to use the glob patterns. So you could have said CL, you know, lift with respect to CL on one row, and then uh, lift with respect to row on the next row. And if like different inputs had different shapes, that's, that's how you would deal with that. Is it always a point uh, like a, an IJ or, or can I do a CSR or other formats? We want rows and calls. 
So always COO format. Yeah. Yeah, it's rules, calls, data, and we'll later later give you the data in the compute partials. Great, we talked about this. So it's vectors, and so we're just giving the information that's in vector form to OpenMDO, and it's expecting that vector non-2D array form. This is a tongue-in-cheek title from Justin. What if we're just too darn lazy to compute the derivatives? What are we going to do about that? We showed you that you can approximate it, and I wanna mention that when we approximate it, it will unfortunately be dense. So this model is still actually a sparse model. There's no off-diagonal contributions in these Jac Jacobians. But if we actually use the approximation method, they will be dense. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And we'll later, later talk about some advanced methods to help remove some of that cost that's associated with approximating partial derivatives. For now, we'll return to this call here. We have this declare partials, again with the wildcards. We have method equals CS. And so that simple added keyword says that please use the complex step method to obtain the partial derivatives. This is done automatically by OpenMDAO. If you're using the complex step method, your compute should be complex safe. If not, you will get bad results. If it's not complex safe, you can use finite difference in the same way here to compute these uh, derivatives automatically. We have some quick rules of thumb. It's fine to start out with finite difference. You don't have to actually be lazy. You can have to be prototyping a model and you don't have time to get the derivatives and that's A-OK -okay to start out with finite difference partials while getting it set up. Or let's say you have a, an idea that you want to try out and maybe it just stays that way because it's so cheap and it works for your very small model, that's A-OK. -okay. If you have a very cheap black box code, it's OK to approximate your derivatives. And for very expensive ones, if you're doing high fidelity simulations, it would not be smart to finite difference across these because of the high cost of doing that. You could do something slightly more intelligent and in finite difference across the residual if you need to. We'll get into more information about what that means for implicit components, what residuals actually are, but it's exposing a different part of that CFD or FEA solver, whatever you're trying to solve, uh, exposing a different part of that to OpenMDO to finite difference across. I will now move on to implicit components, but what questions do you have about explicit components in obtaining partial derivatives? Garrett. Uh, yes. So I should have put in some more examples about this. So let me just talk verbally about this. The wild cards were only to tell OpenMDO which outputs depend on which inputs. It has no notion of the, the structure of these output to input relationships or how it's even being computed. That's a, a different keyword that we would add to it. So if I go back to the star, star here, it would be the same as saying declare partials L or lift CL, lift row, lift velocity. Um, later on in the advanced section, I'll talk about how to save some of the cost of doing these dense approximations. Yeah, so the purpose of this API is that in a more complex component, not every combination of I.O. will actually depend on each other. And like Graham pointed out, some will have different shapes, like the subjects. So star star is just a glob pattern, like a shortcut. Probably best practice is not to do it that way and to specify each individual one, right? But in this simple case, it's fine. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so when you said that you can overwrite the latest declare partial to overwrite the. Oh, I That's correct, yes. I do not do that mostly for clarity, but if it's much easier to do that, let's say you have a lot of components that uh, are or a lot of in, re, output input relationships that would benefit from this and you just have one after that, the last one will be the one used for that. And you, you can even mix, like if everything was CS, but then you happen to know one partial because that was the easy one, and maybe it was also like some really big one. So I'm gonna CS all these cheap ones, but there's this one that I'll do. Uh, you could have star star method equals complex and then override the one particular partial you, you happen to know, right? So. Tim. What happens when you don't declare partials? Because I know that you can say matrix three, like it's the same thing, but it's not best practice to do that. Yes. 
The, the answer is a little bit dependent on how you're doing things. If you don't declare partials and you're using assembled Jacobians or the direct solver, which is what most people will use in, in almost every case for any kind of low fidelity code, then not declaring partials means that there is no partial. It means it's zero, right? Uh, the only exception to that rule is if you're using the matrix-free APIs, which are a little out of scope for this tutorial, but you would use those if you're wrapping an FEA or CFD code, PDE solver, for example. Um, the matrix-free APIs do not look at the partial declarations. Uh, so the, the partial declarations basically don't impact the matrix-free APIs. I mean, it will still allocate. If you called no, declare, no, it would, right. it would, well, it will only allocate if you have an assembled Jacobian at that level of the hierarchy. If you don't have declare partials, it will not allocate memory for it, just to be clear. That is true. If you do not have declare partials, it will not allocate memory. But if you have declare partials, but don't have an assembled Jacobian at that level of the hierarchy, it also. As assuming you have a sparse assembled Jacobian. You have a dense assembled Jacobian. Yeah, but the default is sparse, right? So Brett says that's assuming you have a sparse assembled Jacobian, which is the default, and you probably should never, ever, ever, ever use a dense assembled Jacobian. Um, yeah. Fantastic. We will move on to implicit components. <laughs> I will briefly detail that we can use the same methods to obtain the partials as explicit components. The biggest difference and almost the only difference in terms of derivative computation is that we're computing the partials with respect to the residuals, not with respect to the outputs. And these residuals are functions of the inputs and the outputs. And again, if you're following along at home, we have the implicit examples folder within that repo where you can look at the same code that I'm going to share and you can play along with it. So what are implicit components? This is an extremely brief introduction to a potentially complex topic. But the idea is that anytime we have an implicit expression, anytime that we cannot simply write a output equals something, we need an implicit component to solve for that. And so one example for this, just an analytic example, is the cosine of x times y minus z times y equals zero. And if we try to solve for y explicitly, we can't write a nice expression for that. And so we need to solve for y implicitly by looking at the x and z values. That's an example of an implicit relationship. Uh, in, those, uh, in this case, y is a state. And so that's different than the, the inputs or outputs that we talked about before. Only by name here, we call it a state. And so implicit components have states that we need to converge by driving their residuals to zero. And I'll show that later in an example. Implicit components always requ require a solver. That's a very important piece of information that I forget about once a year. So if you're building a model with an implicit component or an implicit relationship between explicit components, you need a nonlinear and linear solver on them uh, to make sure that they converge well. That's generally true. So implicit components can use any of those techniques that we talked about before. We can use those hand-derived partials or we can use that approximation method, the finite difference or the complex step one. I want to get that out of the way that everything still holds from what we just showed, uh, but it's true here for implicit components. I'll give an example, and Justin and Eric actually set me up well for this by talking about this already. An example of an implicit relationship for aircraft is steady state equilibrium flight. And so we have an aircraft here, we have to bounce the four major forces on it, the force of weight due to gravity, drag, lift, and then the, the thrust force on the aircraft. We can get two expressions here uh, that account for all four of those forces, and we need to make sure that they equal zero in this case to make sure that the, the aircraft is in equilibrium. If we look at this right here and we try to write this out into OpenMDO using an implicit component, it'll look something like this. Instead of a compute before for the explicit component, we have an apply nonlinear, which is applying the nonlinear system solver uh, to kind of understand how to get these resi residuals. That wasn't a good explanation, but the idea is that you're computing the residuals uh, using those expressions that we showed before. So you have all these inputs and outputs. We look at those equations, we translate them into here, and we know that we want them to equal zero. We know that red-hand side needs to be zero. So we set these residuals for alpha and thrust to be computed like this, and that is what we're trying to drive to zero to solve for this system. We could have done this using a bounce component, as, as they discussed before, but we're doing this here using an implicit component that we're writing ourselves to actually get these residuals. So this is akin to that compute function that I showed before for the explicit component. Now, just like that compute partials component, we have a linearized method. And so this linearized method here exists in the implicit component, and it's how we get the partial information of those residuals with respect to the inputs and outputs. 
We just grabbed them out of the dictionaries up there, and then we have that same partials dictionary from before, but now we have access to the inputs and outputs as I mentioned. Because implicit expressions can depend on both the inputs and outputs, we need to consider all of that going into these partial derivatives. If we go back and we look at the, these expressions here, and we kind of calculated partial derivatives for each one of them with respect to the inputs and outputs, we would get partials that look like this here. I, I've done them all here. We have alpha with respect to thrust, it looks like that, so on and so forth. I want to draw your attention to alpha with respect to alpha, and then thrust with respect to thrust. And at first glance, maybe this doesn't make sense. You would say, it's one, right? No, because our residuals here are named alpha and thrust. We're doing our, our residual calculations there. And we need to look at these expressions here and see that if we're changing, in this case, alpha or angle of attack to meet that, we need the angle of attack coming in. We need to treat it as an output that's coming in. And then we also want to solve for the residual and drive that to zero. That's very confusing for me in the beginning. Yeah. yeah. I see. So you're suggesting instead of having outputs thrust, outputs alpha, it would be thrust underscore residual or something. Yeah. Yeah. That would not be possible because they're called the same thing in the output right now, if I'm interpreting this correctly. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't understand what you were suggesting. That's the residual associated with alpha? Yeah. Um, the, the underlying mathematics of mod is why things are like this, because the residual. So I see you, you're suggesting that the, resi the name of the residual should be different than the state. Mm -hmm. R underscore alpha? Right. But then like the algorithms and stuff. Basically like the key for alpha maps to the same place inside the vectors in both. Um, yeah, I can see how we do that. But Right. We would have to, mo so if we wanted to do something like that, we would have to modify the API such that when you declared a residual, you gave the name of the residual and the state separately, whereas right now you just declare an output and we automatically create both the residual and the output associated with the same variable name. Like we could like automatically prepend R. I suppose we could. I, I suspect that would cause. Then that's. I would. I call that magic, like when the framework. Oh, everything just gets an R underscore added, and that's something. Yeah, yeah but. Um, you know, I thought the exact same thing right now, just kind of based on what John had said. The answer is, frankly, this was the API that John Huang kind of argued for successfully, um, on the explicit component side, there's a mapping between the functions that we have. Um, and these functions right here, apply nonlinear, or solve nonlinear, these methods map directly to the mod theory, the, the implicit equations. So there's a link, there's a direct link between the implicit component and the mod papers. Um, but maybe based on John's comment, that link maybe is less important than clarity. So we may have to we, we may have to consider, or maybe we should consider changing, changing the name of those methods. You had a comment, uh, Tim? I'm kind of partial to not changing the, having the names being separate, just because it adds support, having to remember, like, uh, mapping between the two R alpha and alpha, and, like, which residual. I, I mean, the way I see it from a Pythonic standpoint, like, this is pretty, I mean, like, it took some thinking, but, like, you know, this residuals is basically a dictionary, and the key is alpha. So if I need the residual of alpha, right? Like, mm -hmm. I'm just giving the residual value of the equation that defines alpha. And if I need the alpha value of alpha, it's another dictionary that gives me the alpha, the current alpha value for alpha. So um, adding our, having like that, I'm not sure that that is dependent on what it's being referenced to. So just to be clear, you're saying that you're, uh, your thesis advisor is wrong. Just, just tell you how to. <laughs> I, 
I'll, I'll be blunt. I think at this point, the, the naming of the variables thing is a convention that's pretty set in stone. Um, but if, if we want to take a serious look at like a different API, I don't think just prepending R underscore is going to do it. But if we want to allow users to name the residual something different than the output, we can write a poem for it and maybe put together a comprehensive API and see what the community thinks. I see. <laughs> That's right. So in that case, in that case, I would say, right. So sometimes it is completely arbitrary, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes the association, like in PyCycle, the association is actually quite important. Um, if you have a set of equations and unknowns, uh, residuals and unknowns that are not, that you cannot separate, that should be one variable, right? One vector variable. And then the residual is a vector, huh? Uh, well, that's sort of this case, although I would argue that in this case, alpha is properly associated more. Like the derivative is much stronger with alpha with the one. And I would say Professor Ning is correct. Here. Oh, no, you're right. Yeah. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, that's fair. Yeah, definitely. Let me back on out and open up some code. Uh, so mathematically, when OpenMDO deals with that, it turns everything into one vector anyway. So there's not a huge distinction mathematically, but um, I would probably leave those as separate ones personally, but I, it's kind of up to you, yeah. Graham, what can I show you? No, I'm just curious about the I did gloss over that. It's largely the same, but let's talk about that. So we have an initialized function just as before. We have this setup method as well. And here we have all the inputs listed here. Uh, it's the same idea where we have the five inputs coming in. Now we have two outputs here. So these states, maybe this is what you're getting at. The state, in this case, is considered as an output. We would say add output here to tell the implicit component that we're expecting two states. That's the main difference here, is that instead of an explicit output, it's now an implicit output, which also means state. If I scroll down, I have the declare partials as well. Any further questions? That's correct. Technically, the question was, are outputs always states in the implicit model? That, that is correct. All outputs are states. And, uh, there is a way to do explicit outputs inside an implicit component, but I will defer that to another tutorial <laughs> um, or a side conversation. Um, but uh, let me take one step back and say the, the way the math of mod works, the outputs of explicit components are also mathematically implicit. So there's basically a transformation. And if you read the mod paper and look at that transformation, in an implicit component, if you want an explicit behavior, you just do the transformation yourself. I will continue. These are good discussions. So this is the actual in part of the implicit component discussion. This is the last slide for that right there. Again, it's a relatively simple example. The code is in that repo that I showed before and that I just zoomed in on. And Adam, what questions do you have about the implicit component? I could not cover almost anything in detail about it. But the idea is that the partial definitions are close to the same as the explicit component. We're solving for residual expressions. Fantastic. I will move on to the most exciting section. Let me just, Justin. Let me add one more note. Um, even if you're not, even if you're not declaring your own partial derivatives, let's say you want to use finite difference because you're too lazy to, to do analytic derivatives by hand. Um, the notion that what you're differentiating is the residual equation is important because that's what will be finite differenced as well, right? So we will not finite difference across the solver with one very small exception, which is when you do the approx totals thing, which won't be shown in, the, shown in this tutorial, but I mentioned because Garrett mentioned it in his, in his talk. If you do approx totals, you are doing the thing we told you not to do, which is finite differencing across the solver. Um, but if you finite difference an implicit component, you are finite differencing the residual or complex step the residual. 
And so that's important because you may choose to wrap your external code as an implicit component because finite differencing the residual is better than finite differencing across the solver. Right, so that's the semi-analytic approach that we used to like, the, the one NPSS case that we got to work reasonably well was a semi-analytic approach where we finite difference the residuals of NPSS, not across the solver. Um, it does of course mean that if you want to wrap your external code as an implicit component that you have to expose the state vector and the residual vector to OpenMDAO, um, which is not something that a lot of legacy tools are, are naturally built to do to expose their internal state vector. So usually that requires some minor modification. Thank you, yeah. Could you go to the back of this thing? Yeah, right here. Mm, yes, that is correct. That white text should include the words and outputs as well. Yes. Thank you. Again, first time. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Great, I will move on. We're going to talk about advanced features for getting partial derivatives. This may be of interest to, to more people who have already used OpenMDO extensively. We'll talk about partial and total derivative coloring, <laughs> parallel finite difference and complex step, and then lastly, the most important part of derivative computations, debugging them and what that means. And so I showed this page before. We have the docs right here. We talked about the first three or four sections on the right-hand side. And this last section here, reducing the cost of total derivative solves using advanced features is what we'll kind of focus on right now. Again, a very brief look at a lot of features. I'll just show you where they are in the docs and then encourage you to check them out if they sound interesting for your model. So one really cool feature, it's been talked about uh, the past two days, is Jacobian coloring. And so when we know the sparsity pattern of the Jacobian and we know that some of the uh, outputs with respect to the inputs are not related to each other, we can collapse that Jacobian in, in a method called coloring to make the derivative computation more efficient. Here's one example here where we have the outputs on the left-hand side, the inputs on the top side, and we see some relations between this Jacobian structure, but we notice that if we looked at which inputs affect which outputs, that we can save some information here by collapsing this into, in this case, a five by three matrix instead. You can either understand the details of coloring or not and let OpenMDO handle the implementation and what that means for you. It's relatively straightforward to turn that on and it's relatively uh, easy to ignore all of that theory if you want to. And so the docs right here uh, tell you how to do that for total derivative coloring. And uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail about, about what that means. Here's an example from a problem from, from my PhD actually, where I'm looking at the total Jacobian coloring across the entire problem and, and saving some time by reducing the cost of computing these derivatives. So in this case, it's a 481 by 386 system. I'm doing a mission trajectory optimization with some thermal systems as well as the engine. It's a relatively complex model. OpenMDO is able to compute this coloring automatically by perturbing the model a few different times using random numbers and then getting out the sparsity pattern and computing that coloring for me automatically. If we look at the sparsity pattern here, we have some points in the mission that don't depend on each other. Maybe the thermal model doesn't depend on some other part of the model directly. Uh, we can save some cost here. In this case, we see a 75.9% improvement just by flipping a switch that OpenMDO gives us uh, to compute these derivatives. And I really wanna stress, you don't need to know about your actual sparsity pattern. Maybe it helps you look at this and understand, oh, my mission code doesn't necessarily depend on this other part, but you don't need to know that to take advantage of the total derivative coloring. Coloring can also be used for partial derivatives. But first I'm gonna show you what that means in terms of your partial derivative Jacobians. So let's say that you had some uh, approximated derivatives and then you also had analytic derivatives. And you wanna make sure that your analytic derivatives closely approximate the actual information. You wanna see if they are correct and that you have the correct sparsity pattern. There's a built-in tool within OpenMDO here uh, that allows you to look at the approximated Jacobian and its sparsity pattern and then your user defined one and see if the sparsity pattern is correct, and then also if the partial derivative information is correct. Again, this is for a relatively simple problem here, this quasi checkerboard, but we can see that the sparsity pattern does differ between the approximated Jacobian that OpenMDO computes and the one that we're providing to it. We see this difference on the right-hand side, and not only does it show us the sparsity pattern difference, but also the, the order of magnitude difference 
uh, in the derivatives. And so this is one very helpful tool for visually looking at your partial derivatives. It's especially helpful when you have sparse derivatives and you're looking to make sure that you have the correct pattern for those row, rows and columns that we introduce in the declare partials. This is a slide that kind of motivates coloring and how that helps you. And so this is from a, a presentation that occurred at Aviation, and it's using graph coloring to compute these total derivatives. If you look at the number of linear solves on the y-axis and the number of trajectories for this sample problem here, all you need to know is that as we increase the size of the optimization problem, the number of linear solves increases. In the case of non-colored, at, at a rate of one, the slope is one. But in the case of colored, when we use that coloring algorithm to look at the total derivative information and reduce uh, some of the cost there, it scales 0.5. Uh, if we were to aggregate all the constraints as well, we see that flat line there because it doesn't matter how many trajectories we have because we're aggregating all those constraints. But what we see with coloring is that you do save a lot of computational effort and maybe it gets you closer to the cost of aggregation. Maybe you no longer need to aggregate some of your constraints there because of this total derivative coloring. Like I mentioned, you can also use coloring for partial derivatives. I cannot stress enough how experimental it is, but give it a shot. It's in the experimental features section. I do not use it for my work, actually because I did not know that it existed in this portion of it. Uh, I'm excited to know that it does exist as an experimental feature. And so as I mentioned, I use the total derivative coloring. You can use the same idea for your partial derivatives if you want to. And we'll, and we'll show an example of what that means here as well. It's as simple as adding this declare coloring statement right after your declare partials. And in the case of that very simple example, this is what that looks like. So again, we see this compute lift explicit component we have the four inputs and one output. We have that declare partials call, and you have declare coloring here. And we say that for all of it, we want to use the complex step to figure out the coloring and then actually use that method to approximate it as well. This will allow us to use the sparsity pattern of the Jacobian and the coloring and the complex step approximation to really reduce that computational cost here. As I look at this, I have one quick question for actually, I think, Brett. We do not need to give it the shape of the partials. Do we need to give it the sparsity pattern or can it compute that automatically? Yeah, you don't need to give it to That's even better. You do not need to know the sparsity pattern to use this uh, derivative coloring. Professor Ning. I see. So I want to be clear that in this example, I do have that sparsity pattern uh, shown. And maybe you know the sparsity pattern, but you don't want to figure out how to compute the derivatives. Maybe you can look at it and understand it, that's one option. But as I just confirmed with Brett, you do not need to know the sparsity pattern. You do not need to tell it that explicitly here uh, to take advantage of the partial derivative color. It will figure that out behind the scenes. And so just here's a, a scaling example of what it means to use this partial derivative coloring. <laughs> We have here that, that simple problem, that compute lift problem, but I greatly increase the number of nodes on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have the time to compute the total derivatives. We have four different methods here. And in the end, as we increase the number of nodes greatly, they converge to two different lines here. We have analytic dense and approximated that take a little bit more time than the analytic sparse and approximated colored. At the far end of the num nodes there, it takes about 100x uh, longer to use the analytic dense function or the approximation. And so most of the savings here really comes from going from that dense to sparse Jacobian. And so if you can take advantage of the uh, partial derivative coloring with the sparse Jacobian within that partial computation, you can get close to the same savings as the analytic sparse. Now this is with the caveat that this is a very simple and inexpensive system. The scaling would be very different based on the complexity of your compute function as well as the actual sparsity pattern of the components that you're looking at. That's all that I'm going to detail about the advanced features for partial derivative. Uh, there are many more options available in the docs as well. We should use this time now to talk about what works and what doesn't. We can let the dev team know what, what's going on in their, our heads. Or as Justin keeps telling me to, to tell everyone, you can submit a poem if you want to. You can uh, see what other people think about some proposed changes that you have, in this case, especially for derivative calculations. Thank you. <laughs> what questions do you have? Okay. <laughs>
What? Your pre let, so Graham asked the question, yeah. if the yeah. vector is very big and distributed, what do you do? First of all, I say, how did you implement this? Secondly, I say, I'm going to defer to probably Brett here. What do we do? <laughs> no. do, do not use our coloring algorithm on distributed problems. <laughs> this, this algorithm is serial coloring, so the cost of the coloring algorithm for most smaller problems isn't meaningful, but as the size of the, the Jacobians get bigger. More in general. Yeah, so if you're using a distributed, for the most part at the moment, if you are using a distributed, uh, like if your component itself is distributed, if the IO of your component is distributed, in other words, it takes a COM and there's a glo like each input and output has a, a global and a local size. Uh, the best bet at the moment is to use the, the matrix free APIs, and in that context, you're just working with the local with the local size. And so under that context, you're also assuming that the inputs and outputs are equal. Like even if I'm implementing them. No, I'm implicit implementing. No, because you there's inputs and outputs. So the, the number of outputs and residuals must match, but you can have an arbitrary number of inputs on top of that. Well, whatever. OpenMDO does assume that whatever proc owns the state owns the associated is responsible for evaluating the associated residual. So those it assumes that those match. So on any one proc, the outputs number of outputs and number of residuals must match. But you're given the com, and so if you need to do a bunch of distributed compute to compute those values, that's fine. Just at the end of the day, you're going to tell us on this proc that output and that residual. Does that make sense? Okay. There was another question. Yes, yeah, so the, the Jacobian you showed here was a like, straightforward like, vector into the vector actor to matrix. What's the convention when you start having uh, matrix input? You flatten in C order. You flatten in C order. So the, the question was the. the the example we showed here was one dimensional vector input and output. But what happens if your input or output is like two or three or four n dimensional arrays or, or matrices? Um, the answer is that the ordering that's assumed is a flattened C order. So to sort of figure out where everything goes, you flatten it into a flat C ordered 1D vector. Yeah. Um, certain times. If you're dealing with matrices of some of a larger dimension, it actually works out to be easier to deal with the matrix-free APIs for derivatives because you can actually leave things in their original in their original shapes. But that's a an advanced topic outside the scope here. Yeah. So if you're if you're trying to assemble partial derivatives, you flatten everything. That's the the answer. That's for uh, the, the sparse approach too, right? Because that doesn't open an EO to understand any um, any arrays as well. So like you could give it. The, uh, if you're using sparse partials, it's looking for a 1D array. Right. If, you're if you're using dense yeah. partials, I think it's, it flattens it. It's, a, it's expecting a flattened matrix okay. of, of like N by M, right? Okay. Where N is the flattened size of the output and M is the flattened size of the input. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, John.